we, thy unworthy servants, here gathered together in thy name to do most humbly beseech thee to send down thy heavenly wisdom from above, to direct and guide us in all our consultations, and grant that we have in thy fear always before our eyes and laying aside all private interests, prejudices, and partial affections, the result of all our counsels may be to the glory of thy blessed name, the maintenance of true religion and justice, the safety, honor, and happiness of the king, the public weal, peace, and tranquility of the island, and the uniting and knitting together of the hearts of all persons and estate within the same in true Christian love and charity, one towards another, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. This honorable house now resume its sitting today, Tuesday, October 24, 2023. All of the roll. Mr. Clark. Here. Mr. Bartlett. Here. Mr. Holness. Mr. Clark. Dr. Chang, Dr. Clark, Ms. James, Mr. McKenzie, Mr. Chuck, Dr. Tufton, Mrs. Williams, Mr. Mr. Vaz, Mrs. Malawu Fort, Mr. Charles, Mr. Green, Mr. Morgan, Mr. Warmington, Mr. Main, Mrs. Cuthbert Flynn, Mr. Terry Long, Mrs. Cuthbert Flynn, Dr. Dunn, Mr. Hutchinson, Mr. Witter, Miss Smith, Mr. Davis. Mr. Brown, Dr. Brown Burke, Dr. Charles, Mr. Chin, Mr. Cousins, Ms. Crawford, Ms. Daly, Ms. Davis, Mr. The Honorable William J.C. Hutchinson, a long-standing member of this Honorable House, Madam Speaker, and the member from West Royal. St. Andrew, the Honorable Juliet Cuthbert Flynn. May it please you, Madam Speaker. Thanks, House Leader. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. Public business? First, to his feet will be Honorable William J.C. Hutchins, a CD MP, Northwest St. Elizabeth.
Madam Speaker, I would like to thank all those who continue to work for the development of Northwest St. Elizabeth. That's right. yeah. Especially the members of the various community-based organizations who recommend the people in the constituency. The constituency is run and has been by these CBOs and registered community-based organizations over the years. Whether it is the Community Development Committee, Benevolent Society, District Development Committee, a company, or a PMO, they are the ones who determine what must be done in the constituency and give voluntary oversight to them. Madam Speaker, the constituency of Northwest St. Elizabeth has a unique structure in that there are currently 32 organizations throughout the constituency and the president of each organization meets once per month with the political representatives to determine the various activities to be undertaken in the constituency. Over the years, these organizations have been successful in getting grant funding for various projects to include road repair, construction of water systems, construction of an infant school, fencing of play fields, etc. Madam Speaker, resource persons are scarce in the constituency. So the few who are willing and capable of filling the various positions have to be taking on multiple roles across different organizations when selected by the citizens in the area and without compensation. This structure provides transparency and accountability for the projects to be undertaken throughout the constituency. As the servant of the people, yes. and by extension, these organizations and companies in the constituency, I am the facilitator to the agencies or ministries to which these organizations have made their request. Yeah, yeah. Madam Speaker, this year I'll divide my presentation into three sections. First, I will highlight the accomplishments since I last spoke in this honorable house. That's right. In the second section, I will outline the projects currently being carried out and those to be implemented during this financial year. Finally, I will speak on those next financial year, along with some suggestions. I could. Madam Speaker, the accomplishments. Over the years, the biggest problem in the constituency was the deplorable condition of the road network. When the other party was government, not one road was rehabilitated in Northwest St. Every main road, and nobody can say that's a lie. Every main road was in a deplorable state. I can't say that that government, Madam Speaker, I can say that that government failed Northwest St. Elizabeth because they victimized the constituency. So desperate were the residents, they even planted a banana tree in the middle of the main road from middle quarters to new market. Madam Speaker, I continue to salute this administration and in particular, the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation yeah. through Minister Val Warmington yeah. for hearing for hearing and answering our plea. Yes. Now there is no victimization. Yeah. Madam Speaker, since I last spoke, we have done rehabilitation work on the following main roads. Ginger Hill to Mary Hill, Springfield to Four Park, Magotty to Jointwood, Mulgrave to Merrywood, Giddy Hall to Prospect, Giddy Hall to Washwood Gully. This is in addition to roads that were done since 2016. <laughs> Madam Speaker, we also did some rehabilitation work on the following municipal cooperation roads. 
Margaret Pass, Richmond Park, Cedar Spring, Johnson, Bloomsbury, Cool Retreat, Brighton, Cheltenham, and Brednos Wall. Madam Speaker, during the 22 23 academic year, I initiated a pilot project in six schools. 100 needy students were recommended by the teachers to participate in a chicken rearing project. This project saw the students receiving baby chicks and feed. The objective was for the students to raise the chickens for themselves. They were required to feed the birds, give them water, and clean the coops. The goals of the project include, one, promoting agriculture as a viable enterprise. Two, teaching them to be responsible for their own assets. Three, enabling them to manage their own finances. Four, assisting them with their educational expenses, even to college. Five, ensuring food safety and security for the family in a crisis. And Madam Speaker, six, preventing young children, especially the females, from being exploited by adults because of financial needs. Madam Speaker, I was pleased when one, of, one child told me that after selling the chicken meat, she was able to buy some of her school books. <laughs> Madam Speaker, the chicken project has been tried and proven. When I was first elected in Northwest St. Elizabeth, a lady approached me seeking assistance. She had three children and was unable to send them to school, could hardly find food for them. I visited her and saw the condition. She requested and was given 50 chickens and 10 bags of feed. She raised those chickens, sold the meat, and bought more chickens. She continued to do that until she was able to buy a freezer. And eventually, she was able to build a shop. I hope all the children will use their money wisely. And you know, Madam Speaker, that lady, after getting all that, she was a PNP worker. And up to today, she hasn't worked for me. She hasn't voted for me. Madam Speaker, under the new social housing program, two houses have been handed over by the most honorable prime minister to constituencies of Northwest St. Elizabeth. Four more are currently under construction and eight applicants have been investigated and approved to benefit from the program. What a difference a caring government yeah. makes. Madam Speaker, I applaud all hardworking female farmers throughout Jamaica. Yeah. Many of them have been the backbone for the growth of the agricultural sector. By the sweat, sweat of your brow, you and your family shall eat bread. I say to the naysayers, don't try to ridicule and box the bread from someone's mouth when they are trying to uplift themselves to prosperity. Don't frown on those trying to reach their goal. If the lady who got 50 chicken and 10 bags of feed was publicized, would there be anyone criticizing her for making that request if it was made to the Prime Minister. Of course they would. This there. caring government led by our all-inclusive Prime Minister helps all those in need wherever possible to achieve their goals in life. That is the truth. Madam Speaker, I am proud to be the one who handed over a donkey to Miss Diane Blake so that she can continue truth. to show the way for the other females who want to achieve their economic goals. Uh, Madam Speaker, education is the gateway to social economic stability. For the 2023-24 academic year so far, 1,322 students throughout the constituency benefited from back-to-school vouchers to purchase school supplies. 
292 students attended high schools and tertiary institutions were assisted with school fees. Additionally, the top boy and top girl from each primary school who transitioned to high school got a full one-year scholarship. Many also got 50% of their school fees paid. Their monies were sent directly to the institution. Madam Speaker, the construction of bathroom and changing room facilities at the Holland Village Community Center are now completed and the perimeter fence is 25% completed. This facility is the home of the Color Red Football Club, one of the top football clubs in the parish. Madam Speaker, road signage is important for a large constituency like Northwest St. Elizabeth with so many districts and roads leading into them. We have installed street signs on all roads in the constituency. Madam Speaker, the Maybole water system is now complete and will be commissioned by the Rural Water Supply Limited shortly. The project was constructed in collaboration with the production and marketing organization in the area. This water system which saw the construction of a 14,000 gallon water tank, the supply and installation of a solar pumping system, installation of transmission and distribution pipelines, and the installation of an elevated storage tank, tank which will serve approximately 800 residents in the districts of Maybole, Ginger Hill, and Claremont. Madam Speaker, I now turn to projects on the way or to be implemented during the 2023-24 fiscal year. Madam Speaker, we continue to improve the road network in the constituency, and the following roads will be rehabilitated before the end of the financial year. Prospect to Johnson, Mary Hill to Pisgah, Jointwood to Eldersley, and the construction of four walls at Jointwood. Patching is also slated to start next week on the following roads. Johnson Crossing to Louisville, Prospect, Whitehall to Newmarket, Mocker to Springfield, Wires to Four Pass, Springfield to Pisgah, Pisgah to Ginger Hill, and Tombstone to Magathy. Madam Speaker, by the end of this financial year, every main road in Northwest St. Elizabeth would have had rehabilitation work on them. Every single road would have had rehabilitation done on them. All that would be left to be done is some patching. What a difference a government made. Madam, and that is where we are coming from. Madam Speaker, the principals of the schools involved in the student chicken rearing project reported that it was a huge success and are requesting its expansion. So for the 2324 school year, the project will be expanded to all schools across the constituency and the schools that participated in the pilot will get an additional amount for their students. I must commend the teachers who selected and guided the students and the students who applied themselves to achieve the success that they did. Madam Speaker, the expansion of the constituency school garden and breakfast programs are of utmost importance to me. This year, both programs will be expanded in every school in the constituency, providing breakfast daily. And I would like to thank the individuals who have joined forces with me to make this project a sustainable one. Two high schools will be provided with layer birds. They will supply eggs to other schools for the breakfast program. Three schools that have large gardens or school farms will receive extra input and the land will be prepared to produce enough agricultural produce to assist other schools. I'll be calling on the Minister of, Agricult Minister of Agriculture to also join the bandwagon. Madam Speaker, instead of sugar and sweets, we must give our children healthy treats, especially through the breakfast program 
which I am passionate about because these are the projects that inspired me to enter representational politics. That's the truth. Madam Speaker, a spectator stand is under construction at the Lakovia Community Center. The stand will assist in accommodating spectators at the matches hosted by the Fire Alliance Football Club, schools, and other clubs that use the play field. Madam Speaker, some years ago, we initiated a beautification program with ornamental seedlings planted along the roadway from Tombstone to Holland Bamboo in Lakovia. Unfortunately, most of the plants were either stolen or destroyed by stray animals. The Lakovia Community Center is bordered by two housing schemes, one on each side. We'll be constructing a sidewalk in front of the community center leading from one scheme to the other. Residents from both schemes use the center compound for various activities, and many times they have to be walking on the road to get to the center. Ornamental seedlings will be planted between the sidewalk and community center fence within a fenced area. Solar lights will also be installed along the sidewalk. Madam Speaker, agriculture is the backbone of economic activity in the constituency. To ensure the continuity of this, 40 young farmers ages 18 to 35 years have been identified to benefit from a special agricultural program which will enable them to start or expand their agricultural enterprise. They will receive agricultural inputs such as tools, seeds, fertilizer, chemicals. Now I'll turn, Madam Speaker, to projects to be completed beyond 23-24 financial year and suggestions. Madam Speaker, there is not one area in the entire new market division that is served by the NWC. The, N the new market water supply project has been on the drawing board for the past 26 years. A well is in place, pipes were laid in 2016, and six, since that various activities have taken place to bring the project on stream. I have been told that the project will be completed in 2024. The Louisville High School, which will be served from this project, has had to close on several occasions due to a lack of water. Once completed, six districts with a combined population of over 12,000 residents will benefit from this project. Madam Speaker, 80% of the municipal corporation roads in the constituency are in a deplorable condition. We have done many roads throughout the National Farm Road Program, but some fell into disrepair shortly after completion, especially in the hilly areas. I am suggesting that work on these roads, most of them being municipal corporation roads, be monitored by the municipal corporation in order to ensure that the repairs meet the requisite standard of the municipal corporation. I have requested that a number of these municipal corporation roads be repaired under the National Farm Road Program. Madam Speaker, we are again calling for a road to be constructed as a bypass on the western side of Holland Bamboo. We intend to relocate the vendors who are now selling in the Holland Bamboo to one central area with bathroom facilities. A number of accidents have occurred in the avenue, including a police vehicle that hit a cow and skidded off the road. Three Fridays ago, a vendor stall was completely destroyed by a truck that ran off the road. Luckily, that vendor was not there at the time of the accident. Madam Speaker, briefly, there was an animal market in Santa Cruz. It was closed years ago. Persons have animals to sell, but they are unable to identify buyers for their animals. I am requesting that an, an animal market be established and a state-of-the-art abattoir be 
established in, pro in close proximity to the market. Land is available in the area, and so I am hoping that this will be taken up as early as possible. Madam Speaker, the successes and achievements of the government impacts the development of the constituency. The economy has been growing and has done exceptionally well under the guidance of this cabinet led by our Prime Minister, the Most Honorable Andrew Holness. We have been seeing the most comprehensive infrastructural and economic development taking place across Jamaica for the first time in decades. Yes. Northwest St. Elizabeth has benefited immensely from this economic growth. The constituency are grateful and have asked me to say thanks. Yes. Madam Speaker, I would like to thank the Prime Minister for allowing me to, play, to be playing my part towards the growth and development of this great nation. I would like to thank the Honorable Minister Darrell Vaz for having the confidence in me and requesting that I be responsible for the Rural Electrification Program. And on that note, I would just like to emphasize what the Minister Vaz has said, whereby the Jamaica Public Service will be responsible for the installation of line extensions, that's the four lines, and the Jamaica Social Investment Fund will be responsible for house wiring. When connected, residents will only be billed for electricity that they consume. No charges for house wiring. No service charges. No service charges for the JPS connection. What a difference a caring government makes. <laughs> Madam Speaker, in closing, with the exponential development being achievement in all areas in Jamaica by this administration, I have to say that some of us seem to be like the students whose professor gave them a test paper face down. Turning it over, they saw a blank paper with a single black dot in the middle. He asked them to write down what they saw on the paper. Everyone without exception described the black dot. No one focused on the bigger part of the paper. There are some persons, Madam Speaker, who will focus on the small negative things, but do not appreciate the larger and brighter side of our current reality, such as the largest infrastructure development taking place in decades, the lowest unemployment in the country has seen, and our outstanding fiscal achievement. This has been like a vibration emanating from the bowels of the earth. You feel the vibes, you see the development. What more could you want in such a short time coming out of a devastating pandemic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Madam Speaker, the negative dot is easily identified by some with blinkers on. They can only focus on the dark dot and not on the multitude of achievements and developments being carried out by this caring government. And when we look at the accolades being showered on the Prime Minister and Cabinet from foreign agencies and dignitaries, Madam Speaker, it is an arduous task. But we intend to eliminate the black dot as we work towards making Jamaica the place of choice to live, work, raise families, and do business. Madam Speaker, as has been said elsewhere, this is a country in transition, a country on a mission. Let us work with our visionary Prime Minister to get the mission achieved and accomplished. To glory be to God. Great things he has done for this government 
and people of Jamaica. Amen. In all things, we give him thanks. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Madam Speaker, I'm sure you will agree that that was an excellent presentation from the member for Northwest St. Elizabeth. And, and you know, Madam Speaker, the good thing is that this member is of great vintage in this house. And he's one of the longest serving members of this house of representatives. And I think sometimes it is not as readily recognized that J.C. Hutchinson, along with Mike Henry and Carl Samuda, and yours truly are the four longest serving members of this honorable house. And it's important. So I uh, we thank the member very much for the excellent presentation. Madam Speaker, I invite you to ask the member from West Rural St. Andrew to make her presentation. Next, we will have the member from West Rural St. Andrew. I'm not sure if the students here present from Hillel Academy are on their way out or just shifting their seat. It would appear they are trying to relocate so they can get the best of the presentation coming from Minister Juliet Cuthbert Thin, our state minister. So today from Hillel Academy are two teachers, Miss Nardia Johnson, and also Mr. Omar Brown, along with 15 of their students who are deeply interested in democracy and governance and have decided to make it to the parliament to pay attention to the session. Thank you for being here with us today. School was announced, it's Hillel Academy. Um, Next, we will hear from our state minister. <laughs> Honorable Juliet Cuthbert Finn, ODMP, St. Andrew West Rural. Yeah, let them know, let them know, OD. Thank you. Madam Speaker, I stand here today with mixed emotions of humility and pride to represent my constituents of St. Andrew West Rural who voted for me not once, but twice. I also want to mention those who did not vote for me as you are all my constituents and I'm your elected representative. Here, here. My constituents who work in team, your unwavering support and hard work is invaluable and means more than words can say. Madam Speaker, I stand on the shoulders of and alongside many great women who have laid the foundation for me in the political arena of representation and those who continue to show not only the willingness to serve but the outstanding ability to win and work hard. I salute you all. Madam Speaker, might I add that as only one of three women who are sent to the seat of Speaker of this Honorable House, you too deserve special commendation. I also stand here today because there are men who encouraged and supported my decision to enter representational politics. The Prime Minister, the Most Honorable Andrew Holness, Minister Desmond McKenzie, Dr. Oris Chang, and of course, Clive Reed, and not to mention, um, I, I can't not mention the honorable, the honorable Minister Delroy Chuck. I also have to mention my son Troy, and most of all, my husband Levon. They all knew I could win in 2016, and that is what I did. Here, here. 
my beautiful daughter Zara, and my beautiful daughter Zara, I hope, of course, that by my example, you too will always see hard work, dedication, and service to others as your purpose. Wonderful. Madam Speaker, I already knew what it was like to represent my country at a very young age through hard work and sacrifice. I traveled the world proudly carrying the Jamaica flag. This young girl from St. Thomas, who, may, who many said could not make it, I won many medals, but the true goal came in 2016 when I was elected Member of Parliament for the constituency of St. Andrew West Rural. Madam Speaker, my story is unique in our political landscape and in this honorable house. I remember when I was announced as a standard bearer and started on the campaign trail. There were many who said I was wasting my time as a neophyte and that I should stick to track and field. But most of all, they mocked me as a pregnant mother willing to work hard in the trenches for the betterment of my people. I, I prevail for all the naysayers to see, and that is now crystal clear. Madam Speaker, allow me, to borrow a bomb, allow me to borrow a line from a song. It's not an easy road. Many see the glamour and the glitter, so them think it's a better rose. But who feels it knows? Madam Speaker, I know what it's like to struggle, but also take pride in your achievements. I know what it is like to see the finer things in life and have to look the other way. I know what it's like to face physical abuse and still stay strong. I know what it is like to proudly stand on the winning podium knowing I did not cheat. I was not born with a gold spoon in my mouth, Madam Speaker. I have no wealth to brag about, but I did not come here to scrape. Exactly. Like me. Ah. Like me. Like me, Madam Speaker. My fellow parliamentarians are here for service to the people. We did not come here to scrape. Like many of us in this country from humble beginnings with hard work, discipline, and the desire to make better for our families, communities, and Jamaica, we are not here to scrape. Madam Speaker, I do not know where this idea came from. Not you know, from not being born into wealth means you're here to scrape. But that is not our philosophy of hardworking Jamaicans. And I implore our citizens from all walks of life to never buy into that narrative or that mindset. Mm. Madam Speaker, for the past seven years, I've been able to give a voice to 37,000 constituents of St. Andrew West Rural. And I stand proudly on their behalf to give an account of some of the work accomplished since my last presentation and what they can look forward to from me as their elected representative with this administration. Let me talk about water. Madam Speaker, the government of Jamaica aims to ensure all individuals across this island, on this side and on that side, have access to portable water supply by 2030. And as a member of parliament, I've always lobbied from my constituents to have improved water supply for a more livable and comfortable way of life, which is better for the people. Yes, yes. Residents of Mountain Spring in Brandon Hill Division saw the upgrade and replacement of new pipelines for the first time in over 20 years. Wow. These outdated pipes were rusty and broken. I saw the elderly and young alike travel long distances over a steep hillside to catch water from a standpipe. Then they head downhill or further hop hill with several containers of all types. So Madam Speaker, we all know that water is life. And it is known that when this administration talks about pipeline, yes. we actually have water running through it. There are some who only make promises for water for decades and decades. But we know only water can free the people over hills and valleys too. Don't let them fool you. Don't believe a minute that they are with you. Madam Speaker, the residents of Padmore 
in Red Hills saw an upgrade of their two-inch pipeline to four-inch pipelines, providing more connectivity to customers, and this valued at $26 million. The residents of Sterling Castle Heights, also in Red Hills, saw an improved water pipelines with portable water supply, valued at $9 million. Madam Speaker, we're also upgrading um, 8,000-gallon uh, 8, old concrete tank in the Mount Airy section to a 50,000-gallon tank, and this is valued at $30 million. Madam Speaker, this tank, once implemented, will be able to feed at least six communities in the Brandon Hill area, Mount James, Mount Friendship, Mount Prospect, Mount Pleasant, and this, Madam Speaker, will be better for the people. I've requested the laying of new pipelines in the community of Lime Edge in Brandon Hill Division that they have not seen pipeline, a pipeline in their community for over 25 years, they tell me. I've also, they still have no water, Madam Speaker, but we will make sure that this administration gets water to them. I have also requested an upgrade of four-inch pipelines to the community of Trackgate in the Lawrence Tavern area. The residents of this, every community in the constituency must see water in their pipes than rainfall from the sky. And that is my mission. And so, Madam Speaker, a lot has been done, and I know we still have a lot to do and a lot more to come, which will be better for the people. Madam Speaker, let me talk about road work. Several road patching works took place across this constituency, and I want to thank the government for the $40 million program that was instituted to fill this gap. And some of the roadways, Madam Speaker, that were done, Erie Castle Drive, Brooks Level, Stock Farm, Cooper's Hill, and King Western in the Brandon Hill area. Madam Speaker, for quite some time, there was a section of the Temple Hall main road that has been the scene of numerous deadly accidents and sadly, some resulting in fatalities. The persistence of my lobbying for improvements resulted in a significant amount being spent on the rolling out of at least 600 meters of newly laid carpet, asphalt. You're happy for that, right? This was combined with the removal of excess bushing, cutting away and crouching branches along the roadway, and this created a much better enjoyable experience for both motorists and pedestrian. And Madam Speaker, this is better for the people. Madam Speaker, rehabilitation of 1.5 kilometers of roadway in East Kirkland Heights, and this is in the Red Hills area, is being done now at a cost of $80 million. The roadway in the Cavaliers District in, from Burn Shop to Red Ground, and this is between the Lawrence Tavern and the Red Hills Division, is now being rehabilitated at a cost of $30 million. And this stretch of roadway, Madam Speaker, serves the JUTC, and I know that the commuters are elated, and this will be um, this will lessen their drive for at least 15 minutes. Madam Speaker, I want to say a special thank you to Minister Warmington for his timely assistance and intervention. He can, oh, he can always be relied upon to make allocations available to the priorities, uh, priorities presented in constituencies right across Jamaica because I know this will be better for the people. This is also right across Jamaica. This is also a most opportune time for me to request some further road giving priority and special attention under the $40 billion, the $40 billion, you hear that? The $40 billion Sparks program that is coming. It not start yet, that's next year, next year. I must point out that the list is not long, Madam Speaker, but critical just the same. And these roads are Duncastle in Lawrence Tavern, Brooks Level in the Stony Hill area, the Lawrence Tavern Main Road from Temple Hall all the way to Border, Lawrence Tavern to Glengough, right? And the Belmont Main Road. 
Those are the priority areas for this $40 million SPARC program. Madam Speaker, let me talk about parks and recreation. Madam Speaker, the squares, the squares in the constituency, mainly Stony Hill, Golden Spring, Tavern, need to be reorganized and reconstructed. This to ensure beauty of the areas returned and enhanced, and that the motoring and pedestrian public can have a far more enjoyable experience in these spaces. I've started the process with much positive response in Stony Hill with the relevant stakeholders and aim to have all the major areas aligned to bring about the best results for all concerned. We cannot afford for the squares to keep chaka chaka appearance. We want it to be better for the people. Madam Speaker, it is a fact that communities with an emphasis on beautification, green spaces, parks and recreational areas are guaranteed to concrete a more to create a more harmonious space for residents. It is for the environment good for the environment and provides an excellent ambiance for our children to grow and thrive. There is nothing in this world that can supersede a safe space where you can enjoy nature, exercise, or just relax stress-free. And so, Madam Speaker, this was my purpose and intention when I decided to use the allocation for the Florence Hill Community Park. The park, Madam Speaker, will be finished this Friday. This will be a beautiful space for families to enjoy. And Minister Bartlett, you better come to my constituency and open this park. So I want to thank you uh, and the contribution of the tourism product development um, for the annual allocation of $4 million. I was able to combine that for two years and build this beautiful park. Madam Speaker, I must point out that for countless years, the area where this park is now constructed in Florence Hill was used as a major dumping ground. A section also of the Temple Hall Main Road was also used as a dumping ground. And we, I transformed that into a beautiful area. Madam Speaker, this administration, under the leadership of the most honorable Prime Minister, Andrew Holness, is not trying to keep people on a dump. We do not want people to be happy with a dump site in their mindset, thinking that it's their lot in life and that they, because they do deserve better, because we want better for the people. I will continue to transform the spaces in need of beautification for the betterment of the people. It is my intention to replicate this idea across much of the constituency as possible to encourage both agencies and private stakeholders to share my vision. Madam Speaker, let me talk about garbage collection and garbage disposal. While I'm on the subject of beautification and development, I must highlight the ever-present problem of proper garbage disposal in the constituency. Unfortunately, it's a problem we face across the country, and it threatens to eliminate even the best effort at keeping our communities um, clean. As a society, we cannot continue to treat community beautification and proper garbage disposal as only a government problem. The cleanliness of an environment and the prosperity of a people is an inextricably linked no matter what some would have us to believe, greatness and garbage do not go together. No. Madam Speaker, this administration continues to lead the way in its effort to ensure communities right across Jamaica have a proper and efficient garbage collection system in place. The introduction of the new trucks is a further testament and effort to, uh, that the National Solid Waste Management Authority in keeping our nation clean must be applauded. Madam Speaker, we, the legislators and all citizens alike, must accept that we too have a responsibility to play our part. Yes. And it cannot be that we simply just throw our garbage on the streets because someone else will collect it. We cannot be driving in our vehicles filled with bags of garbage and simply throw them into an open lot along the way. We cannot be asking for more garbage skips to be provided. And when they are, we continue to have heaps of garbage piled up beside the receptacles. As a nation, Madam Speaker, we must realize that cleanliness is not just a state of mind, it is a state of being. Last year, 
I provided, because of this issue, I provided seven big bins, large bins, in the constituency through my constituency development fund allocation for projects. These bins were strategically placed after careful assessment of the areas where they were deemed most necessary. The well-needed placement was done in the Golden Spring area to the Lawrence Tavern area. And I must admit that the improvement is pleasantly noticeable and greatly appreciated. Madam Speaker, these things are better for the people. Madam Speaker, while the additional trucks brought about a more efficient and effective system of garbage collection, there have been some instances where consistency is lacking. So I'm appealing to the Honorable Minister Mackenzie and the NSWMA to ensure the good work does not slow down and create a return to the same state of existence we were doing so well to clean up. And I look forward to the new arrivals and having a few of the smaller trucks rerouted across the constituency of St. Andrew West Rural. Madam Speaker, we have seen a difference in the bagging of garbage and we need more trucks in West Rural. It is important to note that in several areas across the constituency, the terrain is, poses a serious challenge. Therefore, I'm asking that special consideration is made for the type of trucks being ordered to dispatch to meet these conditions where they exist. I face these challenges in several places in the, across the constituency of St. Andrew West Rural, but I continue to make every effort to provide the skips in needed areas along with the constant reminders to residents when necessary. Let me talk about schools. Madam Speaker, I'm grateful to this government for the upgrade of several schools in West Rural St. Andrew. And I want to thank the Honorable Minister Favel Williams for the upgrade of the Golden Spring Primary School, the Golden Valley Primary School, and also, right now, ongoing, a beautiful project, if I may say so myself, to a huge facelift for the Essex Hall Primary School. Madam Speaker, just a side note, that school had 25 students only two years ago. We were able to include a breakfast program, and with the upgrade of this school now, we're seeing on a new road leading to the school, we saw an increase of 135 students in that school. Madam Speaker, it is irrefutable, it is an irrefutable fact that proper nutrition is most important factor for learning, especially at the infant and primary level. And so this year, I provided some chickens and feed for the Cavaliers Primary School towards their lunch feeding program. And I'm confident that the new principal will do an amazing job in administering it effectively and efficiently for the benefit of the students. This year also, I will continue to provide assistance once again for the breakfast program for the Essex Hall Infant Department. Madam Speaker, farming. Our farmers are critical to our survival in the provision of our national supply for food. They must be given as much support as possible. Whether they're big producers or small farmers, it is an area we cannot take for granted as we aim to be fully capable to feed our nation with the best that we grow locally. My strident representation has seen farming groups. I have several farming groups across the constituency and they received um, potatoes allocation, um, of course, seed allocation, and also for rainwater harvesting, they, re they received tanks. And I want to thank the minister um, for addressing this problem. This, of course, will boost their ability to ensure the best quality of crop production along with funding in place for drought mitigation. The well-needed farm road I have to thank the Minister for the Farm Road in the Mount, Mount Friendship community, and this was at a cost of $10 million. And I'm confident farmers in this area will capitalize on this major improvement, which will be better for the people. Let me talk about rural electrification. Madam Speaker, I will not try to make light of the need for every household to, uh, to have legal electricity. I also believe the Jamaican public, Jamaica Public Service has a power to provide residential electricity at a more affordable cost. However, there are still several communities without legal electricity. How come? 
Well, one of the issues I've been informed about is the affordability of purchasing light poles and wires. It is time for a more enlightening discussion with the entity to establish the best way forward. Madam Speaker, there are still positives to report regarding the provision of legal electricity in some parts of my constituency. And through this government and the Ministry of Science, Energy and Technology and the Jamaica Social Investment Fund, we are at the finishing stages of connecting a community in Pinto, the Fraser Road community. And I want to thank the people because they've been at the forefront for this. And this, Madam Speaker, will definitely be better for the people. But with that said, Madam Speaker, I must address some serious issues in our informal housing sector. Our constituents must be made to understand and appreciate and agree that simply they simply cannot build um, structures anywhere they choose to establish. The terrain, Madam Speaker, in my constituency, and I know yours, is not suitable for building structures, and this must be taken seriously. We have witnessed a few tragedies, unfortunately, due to unregulated building in places unfit for housing. And clearly, a house in the wrong place with illegal electricity is a double tragedy waiting to happen. So, Madam Speaker, there have been fires due to unregulated and illegal electricity. And unfortunately, there are a few who just refuse to pay for electricity and prefer serious risks taking a chance to place hazardous, and let me tell you, some very colorful wires <laughs> along the lines. I can state categorically that most of the residents want to be connected legally. They want the comfort of using legal electricity along with the safety it brings to their families and communities because this will be better for the people. While we as legislators and elected representatives seek to alleviate the issue of informal housing and settlements, it is only fair that JPS seeks a, a solution for residents of these communities who are willing to pay to provide the necessary infrastructure, the poles, the wires, it can, uh, so this can be a benefit to the residents. Madam Speaker, let me talk a little bit on security. This administration fully understands the challenges of our people and what they face. This cancer called crime is a problem. It has been and continues to be a problem that we must all solve. And as a result, this administration has pumped more resources than any other before. And, and, and invest irrefutable and invested billions, billions of dollars in crime-fighting measures in every area and aspect of our security forces. Madam Speaker, we will, we improve, we improve the re remuneration for our security officers. We can't ask our men and women in uniform to perform in substandard working conditions. And this is why this administration has be began to rebuild, build and overhaul with over 100 police stations across Jamaica because this is better for the people. Madam Speaker, West Rural can't be left out, Madam Speaker. And so I am happy to announce that whenever I see anything happening with the government, I lobby for my people. I am happy to announce that the rebuilding that the rebuilding there is no extra time for members let me not call our name any member please be quiet so we can hear the presentation <laughs> madam speaker i lobby for my people i am happy to announce the rebuilding of the stony hill police station is far advanced the dilapidated building that I saw in 2016, the building did not fall apart. And this will be replaced with a brand new two-story building. The welfare, the welfare of the members 
of our security forces is a priority to this Andrew Holness led government because it will be better for our people. I wish to also thank Minister Chuck for his vision and passion to have restorative justice centers across Jamaica. And in fact, and in fact, one of those restorative justice centers will be built right beside the new police station that Minister Chang has put it and also <laughs> transformational. We will see a new police station and a brand new restorative justice center right in Stony Hill Square. Madam Speaker, these justice centers are linchpin for law enforcement, social services, community engagement efforts, and they promote and provide critical collaboration between relevant entities. And according to data and stated by Minister Tufton a year ago, over 2,000 Jamaicans die from stroke in 2022. It would even be more painful to add that the figures, when you look at cardiovascular and respiratory disease and diabetes, um, that we must take care of our health and our well-being. And I'm happy that Minister Tufton keeps focusing on preventing yeah, yeah. prevention being better than cure. And while providing the necessary health care for patients in need, we can all appreciate that the focus of the Health and Wellness Minister on primary health care and the institution of longer hours at these facilities. Madam Speaker, the Stony Hill Health Center used to be a sight for sore eyes when I got there in 2016. I am proud that in 2018, through the initiative of this government, I successfully lobbied to have Stony Hill Health Center converted yeah. into a beautiful, healthy space for our people because it's better for their people. Yeah. Madam Speaker, during the pandemic, the residents of Lawrence Tavern and its environs had a small, still have a small inadequate space and uncomfortable health center with over 250 patients during the COVID-19. The member's time for speaking has expired. Member, you will not be allowed, you will not be allowed significant additional time. So House Leader. Five minutes. Madam Speaker, Member's time having been expired, uh, Madam Speaker, I beg to move that the Speaker be allowed five minutes to complete, five minutes to complete her presentation. May it please you, Madam Speaker. The question is that the member be allowed three minutes to complete based on disturbances. Those in favor, those against, the ayes have it. Thank you, thank you, Madam Speaker. And so I'm once again lobbying to the minister, um, persons come as far as Glen Gough, St. Mary. Madam Speaker, um, Madam Speaker, again, I want to mention more plans for water, not just plans in the pipeline. This administration, so ably led by the Prime Minister, the most honorable Andrew Holness, understands the difference. And so, Madam Speaker, I'm very pleased to say that I'm looking forward to the massive $1.7 billion ferry to Rock Pond water supply coming to the Red Hills area from this government. This will significantly improve the water supply for the entire Red Hills and Rock Hall communities. Madam Speaker, the content water project that was announced a year ago is in the final stages of procurement, and this is over $700 million. On behalf of my constituents, I would like to personally thank Minister Matthew Samuda for his consistent hard work and also the team of engineers and other team members of the NWC for listening and taking action, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, a bag of hot air with big words is not better for the people. Yeah. Boasting about wealth and status is not better for the people. Yeah. Trying to ruin the good name of hardworking Jamaicans is not better for the people. Yeah. Promoting the run with it culture is not better for the people. Yeah. Madam Speaker, it is my duty as member of parliament for St. Andrew West Rural to ensure better for the people. Yeah. This administration led by the Andrew Holness led government is doing better for the people. 
prosperity for all Jamaicans is better for the people. Madam Speaker, to you and the members of this honorable house for the attention paid to my presentation, I thank you. Good. Very good presentations. Madam. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, I'm sure the House is fully satisfied that the member from West Rural, St. Andrew, presented an excellent account of our stewardship for our constituency. <laughs> Madam Speaker, uh, I beg to move that the debate be suspended until tomorrow. Wednesday, October 25th, when the speakers will be the member from St. Andrew Eastern and Minister of Education, and the member from Southeastern uh, St. Andrew and opposition spokesman on finance. May Those it please you, Madam Speaker. Those in favor? Aye. Those against, the ayes have it. House Leader. Madam Speaker, I beg to move that we now revert to the order paper as indicated uh, by the resolution as, uh, made by me earlier. May it please you, Madam Speaker. Thanks, House Leader. Statement by ministers, announcements. Madam Speaker, I rise again on the issue of the opinion from the Attorney General's Department on the tabling of reports by the Integrity Commission and the Auditor General. You had asked for some time to do your own research and your review. I would like to know whether the opinion is going to be shared with the House. I have reviewed the correspondence from the Attorney General's Chamber, particularly as it relates to those in respect of the opinion on the Integrity Commission, as it is final. The opinion has not been finalized as it relates to the opinion on the Auditor General, and I have written to the Attorney General's Chamber to look at and provide same. However, I do take note of your question whether or not the opinion will be provided. I would like to have a discussion with the president, house leader, and deputy house leader as it relates to my own view as the presiding officer of this chamber. I am not mindful to have it be the thought process that the opinion, the legal opinion from the Attorney General's chamber means that that is the stipulation for the House. And, and as such, and as such, I will crave your indulgence a little more. Clark, Clark. No, I am very I am very, I'm very, I'm very strong in my own perception as speaker that we have to be very careful in believing that seeking advice mean that the house is to feel that another body can stipulate how we function as a house. And so in making decisions, I will not be rash. Having asked, I, no, the, the, the Attorney General's Chamber opinion and read out by the previous speaker is very much in keeping with the speaker's opinion given earlier. I have still not received, no, and I, I said I will get back to you in that regard. The House did not write the Attorney General, the speaker did. Clark, 
Clark. Clark? Clark. Clark? Go ahead. Laid on the table of the I'm, house today. I'm, I'm, hold a minute, Clark. Okay. I have responded and have asked for some additional time to speak to you further. I can make a ruling. It is not my decision to make a ruling at this time. Please allow the indulgence so that I have a discussion because I know where my ruling will um, is, is, is waited to go and I would like some additional time. Madam Speaker, you're, hold on, hold on, please, please, please. Listen. Madam, Speaker, Madam Speaker, I have heard you, but I think it is important that I make a distinction. You said the former speaker sought an opinion. Mm -hmm. The former speaker can't seek an opinion in her personal capacity. She sought the opinion as the presiding officer of the House on behalf of the House. Now that opinion was sought because because there is a dispute between how the former speaker treated with these reports and our view as to how it should be. Now, given that you have an opinion, whether you agree with it or not, I believe it's incumbent to share it. And then we can have a debate about it. But, Madam Speaker, the longer the, 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 the opinion is held, it heightens the view that the, the house is withholding it for a particular reason. Um, let me reiterate, the conclusion of the opinion was read to the house by the former speaker. To be clear, sorry, to be clear, mm -hmm. the former speaker read one paragraph of the ruling. She did not read the entire ruling. I asked for it so we could see the full context. I don't know what she read in the context of maybe a three or four page ruling, which is why I've been insistent on asking for it. So the fact that she read something cannot substitute for the ruling being shared. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, I think in good order, members must appreciate, members must appreciate Uh, this, members, 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 all right, all right, okay, okay, member. Members on both sides of the house, please allow the house speaker. Ma Madam Speaker, I think, I think members must appreciate that this honorable house is essentially governed by the standing order. And the relevant area members. And the relevant sections have to always be adhered to. The speaker sought an opinion from the AG as to how to treat with the reports which the IC presents to us for tabling, and I think in essence what she wanted to get at was whether or not, because the standing order was silent in terms of what time the uh, tabling should in fact be made, it was silent on that. She wanted to find out whether or not there was a specific ruling on that part from the Attorney General. The Attorney General, having given an opinion, I think the opinion would indicate the, 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 the extent of the, uh, of the obscurity, in fact, of that particular area, and, and indicate that it was pretty much left to her to determine the speaker how, how, how the matter is dealt with. Now, now, now it is, it is the, the, the purview of the speaker determine the extent to which she will go in terms of sharing even that bit of information. But, 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 the, but the speaker has been clear and she has indicated that she will in fact indicate to you when she has had the completed opinion of the AG, which is in relation to both the um, Auditor General's report as well as the
the integrity report. So I think that it is fair that members should allow this speaker to have her opportunity to review and then to come to the House appropriately and indicate her position. May it please you, Madam Speaker. Go ahead, Curtis. Laid on the table of the House today are the following. The Indicom Commission of Investigations quarterly report for the period April to June 2023, entitled A Review of Debts in Custody in JCF Lockups for the period 2021. The following is a message from the President of the Senate to the Honorable House of Representatives. I have the honor to advise the Honorable House of Representatives that on the 13th year of September 2023, a bill entitled An Act to Amend the Law Reform Zones of Special Operations, Special Security, and Community Development Measures Act was passed in the Honorable Senate with one amendment for which the Senate desires the concurrence of the Honorable House. And the amendment reads, the schedule to the bill is amended in the second column in relation to the first Schedule to the principal act by deleting paragraph two and substituting therefore the following. Two, in paragraph one, we number subparagraph T and U as subparagraphs X and Z and insert the following as subparagraphs T, U, V, and W. T, a representative of the Child Protection and Family Services Agency, U, a member of the Joint Force trained in sensitivity to matters related to gender-based violence. V, a mental health professional. And W, a representative of the Jamaica Council for Persons with Disabilities. Signed, Thomas Tavares, Finn Snow, JCD, KC, JP, President of the Senate. Madam Speaker, I now ask for your consent for the Senate amendments to a bill entitled an act to amend the law reform, zones of special operations, special security and community development Measures act to be now considered and approved. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Honorable, members of this honorable house, I also have the honor to advise you that on the 6th day of September 2023, a bill entitled an act to repeal and replace the Bail Act and to provide for connected matters was passed in the Honorable Senate with one amendment for which the Senate desires the concurrence of the Honorable House. And the amendment is delete subsection 12 and substitute therefore the following. New clause 8, 12. And 12 reads, a defendant who without lawful excuse removes an electronic tracking device or causes or allows A, the removal of an electronic tracking device or B, the impairment of any function of an electronic tracking device contrary to a, required, a, a requirement imposed on that defendant under section 11C commits an offense and shall be liable upon summary, summary conviction, therefore, before a parish court to a fine not exceeding $1 million or to imprisonment for a term not exceeding one year or to vote such fine and imprisonment. Signed, Thomas Tavares, Finson, OJ, CD, KC, JP, President of the Senate. Madam Speaker, I now ask for your consent for the Senate amendment to a bill entitled an act to repeal and replace the Bail Act and to provide for connected matters to be considered and then approved. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. I was just wondering if the minister could be so kind. Madam Speaker, during the deliberations of the Joint Select Committee constituted to consider 
and a report on the bill. A recommendation was made in one of the many submissions. That recommendation was accepted by the committee for inclusion in the bill, but it was inadvertently omitted from the revised bill. This is for an offense for tampering with the electronic device. The matter is at clause eight of the bill and the addition is to be inserted on pages 14 and 15. Madam Speaker, the instructions to the printer were inadvertently or unfortunately included in the printed bill. And to remind all members of the critical importance of reading this proposed law, every constituent that we represent is impacted by the law. It has new provisions, it has new details. While um, we have retained much of the common law, important changes have been made. And in particular, I want to draw attention of everyone to the pre-charge bail regime, which is contained at clause five of the bill. But there are a number of related clauses um, impacting the pre-charge bail regime. And I also want to inform everyone that before the bill comes into operation, the Ministry of Legal and Constitutional Affairs will have a special training session with the police and the justices of the peace. It is my hope that the judges will also organize their training session and that the Jamaican Bar Association will do the bill as part of their CLPD program. That's the Continuing Legal Professional Development course. It is one of those pieces of law that will impact everyone. And I cannot repeat it enough to say to all members, please read the bill. Please read the bill. After much debate, much deliberation, the bill was passed after a joint select committee considered and reviewed it. Madam Speaker, Madam, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, um, what was clear from the deliberations is that we have to spend a lot of time educating the people, including the lawmakers on the Constitution. A lot of time has to be spent. And I'm pleased that um, funds have been appropriated to my ministry for this function. Um, I don't know if anyone else wishes to contribute um, to this matter before I ask that the amendment be confirmed. Minister, the bill is approved already. And the amendment. Madam Speaker, I now ask that the Senate amendment to the Act to repeal and replace the Bail Act and to provide for connected matters be approved. Out of an abundance of caution, those in favor, aye. those against, the ayes have it. Petitions. Petitions. Members, do not have me name you in here for that type of behavior. Petitions, papers, reports from committees, notices of motions given orally. Madam Speaker, on behalf of the Minister of Finance and the Public Service, 
I beg you to give notice that at the next meeting of the House, I will move the following resolution. The Provisional Collections Tax Act. The Provisional Collections of Taxes, General Consumption Tax, Amendment of Schedules, Order 2023, Confirmation Resolution. Whereas, by virtue of Section 3.1 of the Provisional Collection of Tax Act, herein after referred to as the Act, the Minister may by order published in the Gazette provide for the variation, renewal, or imposition of any tax. And whereas, the Provisional Collection of Tax, General Consumption Tax, Amendment of Schedules, Order 2023, was made by the Minister and published in the Gazette on the 8th day of August 2023. And whereas, it is provided by Section 3.3 of the Act that an order made under that section, subject to its confirmation with or without modification by a resolution of the House of Representatives within 30 days of publication in the Gazette, shall continue for a period of six months next following the publication thereof in the Gazette. And whereas, it is provided by Section 4.3a of the Act. October 2023. Madam Speaker, I further beg to give notice that at a later stage today, I'll move for the suspension of the standing orders to enable me to take 2020. And whereas Cuba remains on the United States list of state sponsors of terrorism, which has grave implications on how to the freedom of trade and navigation, to the principles of the Charter of the United Nations, to international law, and to the rejection of extraterritorial application of a national law, voted again on Thursday, the 3rd of November, 2022, in favor of the resolution, I pause, Madam Speaker, in favor of the resolution and the rejection of extraterritorial application of, national, of a national law, voted again on Thursday, the 3rd of November, 2022, in favor of the resolution at the United Nations General Assembly. And whereas the blockade represents a violation of international law and is contrary to the purpose and principles of the United Nations Charter and the norms governing international trade and the freedom of navigation. My lady, be it resolved that this Honorable House express itself on the morality, legality, and desirability of this decades-old blockade against Cuba and for renewed dialogue between the United States and Cuba and for the lifting of the United States embargo against Cuba. Madam Speaker, I further beg to give notice that at a later stage today, I will move for the suspension of the standing orders to enable me to take the motion. Questions and answers to questions. Motions that may be made at the commencement of public business requiring notice. Motions relating to the sitting of the House. Motions for leave to introduce bills. Presentation of bills without leave of the House first obtain. House Leader. Madam Speaker, um, I beg to move for the recommittal of the item bills brought from the Senate in order to enable the Minister of National Security to make a comment with relation to the bill forwarded from the Senate in respect of the law reforms for Zozo. May it please you, Madam Speaker. Yeah. The question is that we recommit bills brought from the Senate. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. Minister? There is a slip by the printer. I understand the slip rule applies here, resulting in instruction from the Chief Parliamentary Council being included in the bill on page 9, section 24 to be exact. The words 1 delete subsection 2 and substitute there for the following should be deleted. Those were instructions to the printer. I see. This does not require the bill going back to the Senate, but should be, it's a correction. Page, page 9, section 24. The words delete subsection 2 and substitute, therefore, the following. It's, a, it's an instruction from the CPC. Yeah. Public 
public business. There are before matters on public business, the provisional collection of uh, tax, general consumption tax amendment, the uh, ZOZOs, the resolutions in relation to the various elements of ZOZO, um, the Cuban resolution, of course, and the Bauxite and Alumina Special Provisions Act, which will be taken by Minister Green. Um, Madam Speaker, I now move for the suspension of the standing orders to enable me to take the motion, notice of which I gave earlier. The question is that the standing orders be suspended to enable the minister to take the motion, notice of which he gave earlier. Those in favor? Aye. Those against, the ayes have it. Madam Speaker, this honorable house will recall that as part of the 23-24 revenue measures, the Minister of Finance and the Public Service had announced that the general consumption tax GCT on the importation of live horses, small ruminants and pigs will be eliminated to facilitate improvements in the quality of breeding stock on the local market, effective July 18, 2023. The measures, Madam Speaker, with respect to the small ruminants and pigs was made permanent by way of the July 19, 2023 GCT order. However, Madam Speaker, with respect to live horses, due to the number of tariff codes that represent horses on our local uh, market, only part of the measures was implemented by way of that order. As such, Madam Speaker, to address the remaining tariff codes, an order pursuant to the Provisional Collection of Tax Act, the Act, was done. The Act requires orders made under the delegated powers of the Minister of Finance to be confirmed by resolution within the next 30 days on which the House sits after the date of publication in the Gazette. Madam Speaker, we hereby seek with the leave of the House to confirm the provisional order before us to facilitate the completion of the legislative mechanisms to enable this order to be permanent. This measure, Madam Speaker, as has been stated by the Minister of Finance, is intended to stimulate growth in the horse racing industry by encouraging the importation of better quality horses. This will continue to foster growth and sustainable development in the sector as these horses will be used to improve the breeding stock available on the local market. Madam Speaker, it is intended to have the permanent legislation with respect to this matter tabled in this House in the shortest possible time to ensure compliance with the Act. I now commend the Provisional Collection of Tax cons General Consumption of Tax Amendment of Schedules Order 2023 to the House for its continuation in force via this revolution. May it please you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, this matter was brought to the House by the Minister of Finance. There was a debate on it, and the Please. opposition has no objection to what is being proposed. So, your, your members seem to want to contribute to the debate, a number of them, and the ruminants, so they can go ahead. House Leader. Your mic, please. Madam Speaker, I thank the member for his comments and the fact that um, there is consensus on this one. May it please you, Madam Speaker, I therefore uh, move that the resolution be affirmed. The question is that the motion no... That's one. <laughs> that the motion be approved. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it.
gave earlier. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Madam Speaker, the matter before us has become fairly routine. I think I have to, I'm sorry, we, we're not able to do the six months report on this occasion. This will be the last of the 60 day reports. We have just um, approved a minor amendment that was moved in the Senate, and therefore we'll have to go back to, we could not conclude the implementation of that amendment in time for today. But um, the zones of special operation have been in operation for so, over a number of years, and we have seen how they operate, and the amendments will indicate that we can do our reports in a more of a longer period. You haven't seen any? The reports are all there. <laughs> You haven't seen the zone. Clarendon, they say, is a good place. You don't need a zone down there. <laughs> right. You have been behaving yourself, so <laughs> we'll leave you on the next. Your, your colleague in front may have a different, will, will, may be in greater need than you are. <laughs> right. But the zone of special operations that they is seen more a development process. Not all of them have paid, moved out of the whole phase yet, but we are moving that direction, and I expect that, I said, we'll be able to give effective reports every six months. However, the Joint Chief of Staff will still be required to give a 30-day report, and if any member from any of the areas or any member of the House seek to get update at any time within the six months, it will be available. So in the, during this, until we get the New amended bill. We must ensure that the ongoing work within the seven zones of special operations is un uninterrupted. I extend them for a further period of 60 days. Acting on the advice of the National Security Council and in accordance with the law reform zones of special operations, special security and community development measures, in accordance with Section 5 of the Act, which guides that the Prime Minister and Council, after consultation with the Joint Command and by order subject to affirmative resolution of the House of Representatives. Extend the period of peer effort in, period effort in section 43 of the Mount Salem, Denham Town, August Town, Greenwich Town, Norwood Gardens, and the South Amazon Zones of Special Operation, special security and community development measures to be extended for a further period of 60 days. Madam Speaker, I'll just make a passing comment on this because I said this has become pretty routine. The work of the security forces and the social intervention committee continues. Uh, their budget will, of course, be implemented over time, and those that are not yet in the build phase will, of course, be coming on stream later in the later part of this year. I'd like to make a short comment on the impact. There's all these questions to what the true impact of this activity is. Um, when we look at I'd like to look at an area that I dubbed the Southern Crescent in the carpet area, which is contained matter been used to be considered the four most difficult areas in terms of law enforcement issues. Um, that area now has three zones, Dedham Town, Greenwich Town, and the Perry Garden zones in the Southern Zone. And while we have had challenges in maintaining the reduction across the island, we are still at 11%, that entire zone has been characterized by a consistent 20% reduction in homicides and significant reduction in all other major crimes in that year. And I think much of that has to do with the three zones, along with, of course, significant other investment in the police force in the region, as indicated, this is part of the overall strategy to ensure that the infrastructure and the police force has other activities put in place to ensure that they can assume full responsibility as normalcy is restored. So there's more police officers in the area as a result of increased recruitment. We have done significant work on almost all the stations, and we have, in fact, put more resources. There are more cameras in section of, uh, certain in section of the um, Denham Town area, in particular Darling Street, and several are being installed across the business district at this point in time. And the presence of certain increased transportation in terms of patrol vehicles and motorbikes have contributed significantly to what is an emerging stability in that particular difficult area. And those indicate that as we invest and expand the activities throughout the 
critical areas, we'll be able to bring about the level of norms required in these challenged areas. So, Madam Speaker, without much further ado, I want to invite the members of the host to support the extension of the zones in the particular seven regions referred to. Thanks, Minister. Madam Speaker, I rise to support the several resolutions under the Law Reform Zone of Special Operations, Special Security and Community Development Measures Act, and in particular, Madam Speaker, the Mount Salem community and environs in the parish of St. James Zone. Um, it is no secret, Madam Speaker, that this zone falls within the constituency of St. James West Central that I represent. Um, only Sunday, myself and the Honorable Minister piloting the resolution were both in Mount Salem and uh, we were discussing with community members the transformation that has taken place in this space. Madam Speaker, it's, uh, it's like day and night. Um, Mount Salem before the zone and Mount Salem today. I am aware that it was the first zone declared under the law when it came into effect. On the first zone that was declared on September 1, 2017. Uh, most of the work has been completed and the report speaks to the next step. It highlights the investment of over $300 million in the zone. The transformation is obvious to everyone who is there and who knew it before. Uh, there are a few remaining steps to be taken, Madam Speaker, and they primarily relate to implementation of uh, the infrastructure improvement to the Mount Salem Primary and Infant School multi-purpose sports complex and the enterprise development support and rehabilitation of the Mount Salem Police Station. Interestingly, these two institutions are located on the other side in the constituency of St. James Central, represented by my colleague, the Deputy Speaker, Mr. Clark. So the community of Mount Salem is split between the two constituencies, but the infrastructure support all residents. Just to say to constituents who are listening that at some stage the zone will be wrapped up and the work will be put squarely in the leadership of the community. And it is my hope that we will make progress and that we will have no reverses on the gains that we have made. Madam Speaker, I support the extension of the, of the zones. May please. Thank you. Just checking if we have any contribution from the opposition side. There are no mics on. Okay. Madam Speaker, I was actually just waiting to be acknowledged. <laughs> you know, I really did not. And that is the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. But as I sat and reflected on the importance of the zones of special operations and my last week in the constituency, I believe that the residents would never forgive me for coming here and not speaking. Everyone knows that we have supported the ZOZO and we intend to support um, those that are before us again today. But Minister, all is not well in Denmark, nor in the Greenwich town, Zozo. I have a couple of things I want to say. Whenever I come, I always look at what we have done and the status, and that's good. Persons ask me, and I'm still not able to say to them, what is the plan? And so I believe at some point, we need to have a fairly good idea as to what are some of those things that are intended for the next six months or for the next year, just so that persons have an anticipation, yes, of what to expect. And they have asked me to say that. 
But the one that I really want to talk about, we have the Restorative Justice Center that's there. Very welcome, very needed. A number of individuals have been trained as restorative justice practitioners, and they are putting those skills to work in the constituency. We also have those who have benefited from um, the entre entrepreneurship grant, and all of that is very good. But I believe that the single most uh, devastating aspect of having a Zozo is the number of murders that we have seen right at the foot of the Zozo. Last week, for example, a group of seniors were sitting at their gate, um, comforted by the fact that they were sitting right beside the, the post, right beside the checkpoint, and two of them were killed. One, I think, is probably still in the hospital, and another is home nursing um, gunshot wounds. And why it troubles me and it troubles all of us so much is that, contrary to what others in this house, especially facing me, might say, we want to see a safe Jamaica, and we want a Zozo and a system that works to protect our citizens. And I believe that every time there is a, a murder within the Zozo, it actually reduces the confidence that residents have in the Zozo, especially because this last one was right beside the post. Yes, right beside the post. In fact, one a, a shop owner told the story of not even knowing what was happening outside, except that she saw two soldiers run into our shop, yeah, looking somewhere to hide. Now, I want us to understand what that does to the rest of the law-abiding citizens. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not throwing all of this and to say it is the minister's fault. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that it is a state of affairs that requires some kind of action and maybe some additional thought about how we address it. It cannot be that we continue to have individuals who are in prison or overseas directing what happens in our communities. It cannot be that we are having the level of extortion in those communities where members are still fleeing to save their lives. It cannot be, and something we have to do something to be able to arrest that. Yes, I stand ready as usual, Minister, for the conversation, for the discussion. There are some other reports that I don't want to say here, but I do, I'm going to have that conversation with you. I'm really going to, because there are some other things that are happening that are absolutely not, um, we can't allow to continue to happen. Um, Minister, I say that, um, and uh, with the greatest of hope that we can get to a point where we will not have to have these discussions anymore and where I don't have to come here to lament about those individuals who have been killed. Um, I also believe that there has been an erosion in the confidentiality, not just the confidence now in the police, but also in the confidentiality of the police. And so the relationship between the citizens and the, and, and the Joint Command um, that is in jeopardy. Partly because we are having these egregious acts being committed under their nose. And to be honest, at this point, many of them don't believe that it's only gunman is part of the problem. Yeah? Um, and I'm sure that your officers would have picked it up. I'm sure that um, you would have said it, they would, that you would have gotten such reports. I want to have that conversation because I don't believe that as a and uh, that's what the design of it. The, well, maybe I haven't made it a little bit too wide in terms of as the initial thought was to have senior officers of the various MDAs um, attending so that you could take decisions. I think we have brought to more consultative committee where all members of the community are being involved and there's demand for more and more participation. I'll have to look at how we can overcome that to ensure that we get decision makers and therefore the members or affected can know what's happening over the next six months or the next and, and, and onward.
a critical part of what we do, and we have to maintain that. I think the budget required is one that we cannot afford not to spend. The impact of a number of very brutal killings recently has been of concern to the minister, the government, and to everyone of wealth in the society. But I'm, in fact, doing a review of all of them. It's a drive-by shooting. We have had, you have had a traumatic event in your own zone where two elderly citizens were killed. And of course, my colleague and Minister of State had a similar event in, um, in her constituency. We have seen some other bizarre activity. I think just yesterday, or day before yesterday, a son killed a mother. There's a kind of wanton violence emerging, which is beyond normal policing. And part of the drive-by shooting, of course, which I'm examining, is that this is also is a signal of some increased level of policing activity, that they don't shoot and hang around. They don't even walk. They drive by, ride a bike, and they shoot wildly. Whoever is in the way, they will focus, or try to focus on an individual. But they're at the shop front playing domino. They're talking at any pace in the community. So whoever is nearby is at risk. Um, we are examining and I will say more with the Commissioner of Police, how we can, in fact, take steps to begin to intervene in these activities a bit faster. Uh, the, the view is that some of this is coming from, uh, the police may respond more quickly, but they do the damage already. So we have to find a way to ensure we can intercept him before they get to that point. Or if they do commit an act, that the interception will catch them on the way from, so they will have to change their tactics and approach him in the course of time, and we have had some significant discussion. The issue of prisoners issuing orders has been a long-standing activity discussion. And since we are in government, we have looked at different activities. We have amended the legislation to make, um, to create pe bigger penalties or serious penalties and hold members who go to the prisons accountable if they breach the regulation and take activities there that um, instruments that can contribute, especially telecommunication equipment. While we have had some improvement, it is not yet where it should be. Um, we are serious about building a supermax prison that is a facility that will be able to be, become like a Friday building that you cannot call out unless you call out on the, on the line. Um, we should begin that process late or early in the new financial year, late this financial year, so we're doing it as a strategic activity, and we will be seeking funding from the contingency funding on the Ministry of Finance, because we consider that important. The work is proceeding. It took a while to get to where we are, because the first designs brought to attention to be beyond our capacity in the budget. But we realized that we could do something on the simpler and focus on a hundred of the very difficult characters. And that's where we are going now in terms of seeking to reduce that impact. It has to be done. There are quite too many, well, you know, who are involved in initiating criminal activity and in particular murder, contract killing on the road and really creating a certain level of um, fear in communities where it will not. So the character of the shooting is far more frightening and far more bizarre. And we will take steps to bring that under some level of control and continue the process of investing in the broader police force to prepare them to restore a certain level of normalcy. On that basis, Madam Speaker, I, am, I want to say that I'm confident the zones of special operation are working, but we have to monitor them on an ongoing basis and take realistic steps to change policy as we move along. We are committed to providing the opportunities for those who are most vulnerable, equipping them with income earning skills to ensure a more prosperous future and, of course, a safer and better community. I seek the affirmative support of the members of my house um, as we move to extend the zones in these seven areas. Those in favor of the extension of the seven zozos here listed on our agenda. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Thank you, members. House Leader. Madam Speaker, uh, we will now ask the Minister of Agriculture and Fisheries.
fisheries and mining to make his presentation. Yes. Madam Speaker, table before the Honorable House are the bauxite and aluminum industries special provisions associate producer Discovery Bauxite Operations Limited, order 2023, and the bauxite and aluminum industries special provisions associate producer Discovery Bauxite Operations Limited, order 2023 resolution. Madam Speaker, this Honorable House should note that the Bauxite and Aluminum Industry Special Provisions Act was passed in 1978, and the Act makes special provisions for Bauxite, Alumina, and other related enterprises that are involved in the winning of Bauxite and or Alumina in Jamaica. In this regard, the Act makes provision into alia for the power of the Minister to declare on behalf of the government to confirm agreements and arrangements between the government and bauxite producers. The power to declare as associated producer, any bauxite producer, and the power to transfer or vest lands of bauxite producer. The act also facilitates exemptions from approval, consents, transfer tax, stamp duty, and fees for lands vested by an associated producer. Madam Speaker, this is fairly normal operations for our bauxite producers in the country and we're seeking now to, rec to regularize the arrangements that we have with Discovery Bauxite. With, within this framework, Madam Speaker, the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Mining will be working with Discovery Bauxite to ensure that we are able to transfer properties in subdivisions established by Discovery Bauxite Operations Limited to ease the backlog of titles owned to re owed to resettlers. So, Madam Speaker, in the bauxite mining industry, oftentimes persons are called upon to resettle, and as such, various subdivisions are done and people are resettled in those subdivisions. But historically, we've had challenges with getting titles to those people. It has taken an inordinate length of time. However, we have recognized, Madam Speaker, that using the vesting position, po provisions, we're able to shorten that time period and facilitate a quicker transfer of titles to our settlers. And as such, we're moving in that direction to try and ease the backlog of titles owed, especially to persons in that Saint Anne belt. In keeping with the provisions of Section 4.1 of the Bauxite and Aluminum Industries Special Provisions Act, on October 4, 2023, I declared Discovery Bauxite Operations Limited an associated producer. It is to be noted that I made the order on the basis that Discovery Bauxite Operations Limited is engaged in the winning in Jamaica of bauxite and in my opinion is in a special relationship with the government by virtue of an establishment agreement dated September 6, 2018, entered into with the government of Jamaica acting through the Minister of Finance and the Public Service and the then Minister of Transport and Mining. It should also be noted that Section 4.4 of the Act requires that this order be subject to affirmative resolution in the House of Representatives. In these circumstances, given the matters highlighted, Madam Speaker, I ask this Honorable House for the full support in affirming by resolution the Bauxite and Aluminum Industries Special Provisions Associated Producer Discovery Bauxite Operations Limited, Order 2023. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Any contribution? House leader. Uh, uh, no, Minister, sorry. I know I now ask that the motion be approved. I'm just indicating that again, this is something which is in the normal course of the government doing business. So we don't raise any objections. Thank you, Minister. 
I now ask Madam Speaker that the motion be approved. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. House Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. House Leader, turn your mic on again, please. There was another mic on. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. At this time, I ask you to invite the Honorable Landa Terrellon, Minister of State in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, to take the Cuban resolution. Thank you. On the Cuban resolution, we invite State Minister Honorable Alando Terrellon to his feet. Minister Terrellon. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, before I continue, please permit me to acknowledge the presence of Ambassador Fermin Sanchez and his team member from the Embassy of Cuba who are here today. Mighty be so acknowledged. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I now move for the suspension of the standing orders to enable me to take the motion, notice of which I gave earlier. Uh, Madam Speaker, I must also create the leave of this honorable house as it relates to the standing order that relates to no other language but that of English to be spoken in the Honourable House, and know that at interval, Madam Speaker, more likely in the conclusion of the matter, for the benefit of Ambassador and the people, our brothers and sisters of Cuba, that I be indulged to revert to the Spanish language at such, inter at such interval, Madam Speaker. The question is that the motion notice of which was given orally be approved. Those in favor? Aye. And also, leave is being sought of the House to speak a language other than that, delineated in our standing orders, which is English. Those in favor of that departure? Thank you, the ayes have it. You may ask if you would like to, and that, uh, that was the point. You may speak any language you would like, <laughs> however, what one expects is that, respectfully, the permission of the House is requested. Thank you very much, Member. Madam Speaker, thank you. Having received the permission of the House as it relates to the motion, I wish to note that the government of Jamaica remains firmly opposed to the unilateral application of economic and trade sanctions by one state against another. In this particular instance, the government of Jamaica remains opposed to the application of a unilateral embargo by the United States against our brothers and sisters, the people of Cuba. <laughs> My lady, such a measure has undoubtedly obstructed the conduct of commercial activity, trade and economic cooperation, and has certainly impacted on the lives, livelihoods, and very human rights and dignity of the people of Cuba. Indeed, in keeping with its obligations under the Charter of the United Nations and international law, the government of Jamaica has not promulgated any law, legislation, or measure that would infringe on the sovereignty of any state or its lawful national interests. And we believe that this particular embargo does in fact infringes on the sovereignty of our Cuban financial and trading operations the impossibility of processing non-immigrant visas in Havana, intimidation of countries that send the Cuba fuel supplies, attempts to undermine recovery of the tourism sector in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, and a campaign aimed at discrediting Cuba's medical cooperation programs. According to the Cuban authorities, economic damages attributed to the embargo amount to approximately $159 billion US dollars over the years. In fact, my lady, more specifically, from the 1st of March 2022 to the 20th of February 2023, the blockade is reported to have resulted in losses to the government and people of Cuba estimated at United States $4,867,000,000. Cuba's economy has been severely affected by the embargo. It has limited the country's access to U.S. markets and financial institutions, making it more challenging for Cuba to trade and access foreign investment. Madam Speaker, the embargo has also curtailed access to supplies, raw materials, chemicals, and technologies. 
there have been shortages of food, fuel, and other basic necessities. And in keeping with the strict measures of international law, my lady, the requirement is that no country should impose a blockade as it relates to food, fuel, medical supplies, not even in wartime, my lady. The restrictions on travel to Cuba by the United States citizens have, on travel to Cuba by United States citizens have contributed to depressed tourist Minister numbers. Minister Terrellong, I'm sorry to have to interrupt your presentation. This is not the courts, it is in fact the parliament. Please refrain from saying my lady in this honorable house. <laughs> I, am, I, I, I am guided, Madam Speaker. <laughs> You know, Madam Speaker, with some 20 years in the legal fraternity, at that time, it's, you know. But my lady, it does have a ring to it. I'm sorry, but my, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, referring to you, Madam Speaker, referring to you as my lady is in fact speaking truth, my, Madam Speaker, nonetheless. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I continue. The restrictions on travel to Cuba by U.S. citizens have continued to depress tourist numbers with a significant reduction in demand for goods and services in the private sector over recent years. Cuba's banking and financial system continues, therefore, to be impacted. The resulting monetary financial losses incurred by the Cuban economy are said to exceed $280, million, $280 billion, 200 million Cuban dollars between March 2022 and February 2023. Madam Speaker, the U.S. embargo against Cuba now spans over six decades. It has had far-reaching implications on the Cuban people, its economy, impacting various aspects of their lives, most notable access to essential goods, including medicines and medical equipment. Cuba, nonetheless, has also been unable to undertake significant achievements in several factors beyond tourism, notwithstanding the embargo, the Cuban people remain resilient. The Cuban people have undertaken significant advancements in healthcare and medical research despite the challenges. The Cuban, the Cuban people must also be applauded for its willingness to, de to deepen South-to-South -South cooperation am amongst developing countries. This should also be applauded. Madam Speaker, the lifting of the Cuban embargo is one of the great challenges faced in the United Nations over the last six decades. Notwithstanding the calls for the embargo to be lifted by the United Nations General Assembly through its annual resolutions, it remains undone, notwithstanding overwhelming support. The position for the lifting of the Cuban embargo was also reiterated by Senator, the Honorable Kamina Johnson-Smith, in her address during the just concluded high-level week of the 78th session of the United Nations General Assembly in New York in September. Jamaica, therefore, continues to support the resolution in the United Nations General Assembly as a concrete reflection of Jamaica's support for and solidarity with the government and people of Cuba. Madam Speaker, as it relates to the Houses of Parliament, the Jamaican Parliament has also had a very long tradition of supporting the motion calling for the lifting of the economic commercial and financial embargo imposed by the United States. This motion has regional and international importance in calling for an end to the embargo with which unjustifiably denies the Cuban people of their human rights and adversely impacts their personal and national development. Jamaica also calls for Cuba's removal from the US list of countries considered as a sponsor of state tourism. Madam Speaker, this unfortunate designation, what did I say? I, I, I repeat, my lady, Jamaica also calls for Cuba's removal from the list of the United States countries considered sponsors of state terrorism. This unfortunate designation is one more hurdle on Cuba's pathway to economic stability, growth, and development. Madam Speaker, the challenges faced by the people of Cuba over the last 60 years indicate a clear rejection of the human rights agenda of the United Nations Charter. Madam Speaker, as a people, we take special pride in raising this particular motion in support of our brothers and sisters in Cuba, even more so as we celebrate United Nations Day 2023 on today, October 24th, 2023. My lady, this is important because a fundamental... Madam Speaker, 
this is important as a fundamental tenet of the United Nations is ensuring that the human rights and dignity of all people are in fact respected. Madam Speaker, it is important to note in the world that we live that the human rights and dignities of all persons should extend race, should extend boundaries, should extend religion, should extend ge geography, and also, Madam Speaker, that this too must be applied to the people of Cuba, not after 60 years of this unfair and unlawful embargo. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I first would like to associate um, my remarks and to adopt in full the remarks by the member who just moved, of East Central St. Catherine, who moved the resolution on behalf of the government. Madam Speaker, that's, this is a very important development because we have come a long way, and we now speak of on this, poly, on this resolution, which has now become an annual, and I wouldn't want to add the word ritual to it because it remains very important. And for every time that this resolution is moved, I think it behooves us to enjoy a debate and a discussion on it because of its central importance, and the importance of which I speak, Madam Speaker, is not just to the Cuban government and people. It is important to us in Jamaica and in the Caribbean because, Madam Speaker, to declare an embargo of this duration and of this nature is a declaration of war. And this has been maintained against the Cuban people and government for, for decades. And so we, are, we move to ask to what end? Why is it continuing when it, it, it should be obvious to everyone that the objective has long lost its purpose, its moral quality, and any rational or semblance of any support, not in the United Nations, not in the Caribbean, not anywhere except in Miami. Because, Madam Speaker, it is clear to me that this is really a, an internal political issue in the United States of America. It has ceased long ago to be a foreign policy matter. And I've told this story in this house before that when I served as foreign minister, I had a discussion with a, a certain per, um, foreign secretary on this issue. And when she raised the matter of Cuba with me, I was moved to say to her, but Madam, Madam Foreign Secretary, I am I'm not at liberty to speak to you about Cuba because Cuba, for you, is not a foreign policy matter. I can only speak to you in my capacity as foreign minister on foreign policy matters. Cuba has long been removed from that and is now in the realm of political, party political matter. And so the, the people of Cuba, Madam Speaker, are subjected to really an outrageous immoral, illegal um, imposition by the United States. And I'm very pleased to see that we in this Honorable House can come to the stage where we can speak on this as a common policy. And a common policy. Because when it first started, it had Re resonance of Cold War, vestiges of the Cold War. We have long passed that. And we are suggesting that the United States should long pass that. And indeed they have. Because we know that 
relationship has been normalized with Vietnam, with China, with Russia, excepting the Ukraine um, matter that has intervened. And so the, it, it can't simply be that the Cuban people and the embargo is in place because the Cuban operator communist uh, a, a centralized system of government. And their relation with their so -called yeah. it, it, can't, it can't be. So what then is the purpose? And it must be, Madam Speaker, that it has really been reduced to what we can call, only call collective punishment on the Cuban people. And that is immoral. It has, it, has, it, has led to, it has led to a grotesque kind of arrangement with Cuban, Cuban people, even now. Some of them, because of the economic hardship that has visited, been visited on the Cuban people for such a long time, and as resilient as they have been, they are human. And when we see what is happening at the border in Texas, and we say, well, what, what is going on? Well, the truth is, a lot of that, the gov United States government bears the responsibility because of its domestic, its, its, foreign, its foreign policies in other countries in the hemisphere. And in Cuba, it is clear that some of those at the borders are Cubans fleeing, and fleeing the, 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 the injustices and the economic hardship. Yeah. That is accumulating, it's not receding. Yeah. And as the move of the resolution pointed out. The, 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 the regulation attendant, attendant on the embargo has been tightened, um, not loosened as we expect. We were hopeful when the former President Obama visited Cuba that we'd see uh, a, a, a new dawn, a rapprochement, a reopening. But lo and behold, I have to declare my own disappointment in this Biden administration. I have to declare my own disappointment that rather than continuing and evolving the normalized arrangement, there has been in fact a reversal and a tightening of the embargo. Perhaps the most cruel of which, Madam Speaker, is, is the declaration of Cuba as a state sponsor of terrorism. Now who, who, who believes that? Nobody. Nobody believes that. It's not credible. It is not credible. And so the call must be supported for the State Department, for the United States to really change its policy. Because Cuba, Cuba has been a force for good. And whatever the disagreements are about forms of government, that should be the matter of regular constructive engagement. If you have to have a political, we have political dialogue with our, with our, with our friends, our partners, all the, all the time, on a range of issues. So the, the mechanisms are there for those kinds of dialogue, and therefore it makes really baseless and unfounded this continued punishment of the Cuban people through this embargo. It is nonsensical. It is unworkable, and it's really above all, it is immoral, it is illegal, and it is unacceptable to the people of the Caribbean. And the debate in this house, and the reason we, this, this debate was moved, this resolution was moved, is so that we take it out of the realm of not just foreign policy, but that the people of Jamaica are speaking through its representative that we are not in favor of what is happening to our brother and our colleagues. And it is, it, is a, it, is only, it is only such debate that takes place in our region because for the others, it's, it's, it's really a foreign policy matter and nothing more. For us, it's a deeply personal matter because the people of Jamaica now can relate because so many of our people have benefited positively through training, through our cooperation, whether it's been business, farming, medicine, the, the professionals have benefited. So for us, it's no longer simply a foreign policy matter. It is really a deeply personal matter. And so this debate is appropriate in this house, and we will continue to, and, and, and really, Madam Speaker, the, the, the importance of it is for us to continue to say, 
even to, and to speak true to power, as powerful as the United States, to simply say you are wrong and might does not make right. Might does not make right. And we will continue to support until the, the, the American government sees the need to remove this facade, this real tirade and outrage of continuing to, to, to impose collective punishment on the Cuban people. I thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Can I have please? Just so that it's a little easier for me to read my phone. Madam Speaker, um, I am also going to ask permission um, because I may or may not speak in a language other than English. And just in case I do, I wanted to make sure that, uh, yes, that I have that permission. Permit me also, Madam Speaker, to also add my words of welcome to uh, Hold a moment, His please, Excellency member. Con hold a moment. Question, is that permission be allowed to the member to speak in a language other than that, allowed in the standing order, um, which is English? Oh. Madam Speaker, I'd, House Leader. I'd like to I recognize that a practice might have been started, but I'd like to caution because the hands are is not geared for language other than English at this time. So in the interest, in the interest of ensuring that there's accurate reportage of whatever is transpired in this house, it is suggested that members stick to English. May it please you, Madam Speaker. I don't want you cursing or coming out of the way of saying I know. Say anything on Before the member com comments speaking, I would have spent my entire weekend with the management team of the parliament and the concern as it relates to Hansard is a very real one. Not just in terms of translation, but even in the way we conduct ourselves in the house. It makes it very difficult for the Hansard writers to hear and document sometimes what is being said. It is actually not um, something that is a joke. Uh, as a parliament, we are going to be exploring exactly how we remedy the problem in terms of the ability of Hansard writers to hear exactly what it is that we are saying at all times and properly document in reasonable time. Embo. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. It, um, I, have taken, I had taken that into consideration, and therefore um, the few phrases and words that I use, I will also translate so that there is no problem. So, <laughs> I, I, am, I was saying, Madam Speaker, I was asking to add my words of welcome to so Excellency Fermin Quinones Sanchez, the Ambassador of Cuba, His Excellency Fermin Quinones Sanchez, and the staff of the Cuban Embassy, who is here for this um, occasion. Madam Speaker, I actually did not see a notice that we were going to have uh, this uh, discussion today, and so I'm not as prepared as I normally am. But <laughs> I do hope to do justice to what I believe is really an important discussion. It was in 1962 that President John F. Kennedy imposed the U.S. embargo on Cuba. That's how long ago we're talking about, 1962. Today, we have the opportunity, as we join our voices to the 100 and 184 other members, member states of the U.N., who voted last year in favor of the resolution that's before us to express ourselves in terms of the morality, legality, and desirability of the decades-old blockade against Cuba and the call for renewed dialogue between the U.S. and Cuba and for the lifting of this inhumane blockade against the people 
of Cuba. There is no doubt, Madam Speaker, in my mind, that any U.S. administration, including this one, has an obligation to address the many ways in which this U.S. policy contributes to the worsening humanitarian situation in Cuba. President Reagan was actually the first one to add Cuba to the state sponsor of terrorism list. And President George H.W. Bush signed the Cuban Democracy Act to once again prohibit Cuba's ability to buy products from U.S. companies operating in third countries. Further cementing the permanence of the campaign and the 1996 Hems Burton Act made it virtually impossible for the president to undo the set of sanctions without congressional approval. In 2014, President Obama broke the mold in terms of the U.S. approach to Cuban policy. His administration lifted restrictions for Cuban Americans to travel and to send family don and, and, um, and to send family and donate remittances. Many of us breathed a sigh of relief at the time, as this signaled the biggest change in U.S.-Cuba policy since the diplomatic relations were severed in 1961. And it ushered in a new era in the relations, leading to a boom in private sector activities in Cuba and significant openings for civil society discourse and other reforms of the Cuban government. However, it didn't last very long. In 2017, the Trump administration undid all the progress that Obama achieved and imposed new restrictions, including bigly, very bigly, including prohibiting US companies from doing business with certain Cuban companies, prohibiting US visitors from staying in hotels operated by certain companies, and eliminated people to people education, travel, and a lot more. For 61 years, the economic embargo has failed, as a member from Western St. Andrew said, to achieve any of its stated policy goals, but it has exacted a high human cost, stifling the development of the Cuban economy and making life, daily life harder for Cubans. A 2021 estimate by the Cuban government found that the embargo has cost the country close to 144 billion US dollars. And a similar figure has been acknowledged by the UN. So we know what we're talking about. But the truth is that the Cubans have long held in their heart that Morir por la patria es vivir. To die for one's country is to live. And so they have faced the embargo with that kind of courage. The U.S. embargo over the years has had nefarious consequences for Cubans, jeopardizing health and welfare of women, children, and people living with cancer and HIV AIDS. That is the result of the blockade that we have. The complex licensing requirements imposed by the US effectively prevents food, medicine, and medical equipment from reaching Cubans. The Biden administration's show of empathy with other countries during the pandemic led them, if we would remember, to issue exemptions to certain sanctions interfering with public health responses in Iran, in Syria, and in Venezuela. But alas, these same efforts were notably absent from Cuba. Notwithstanding these obstacles, Cuba has achieved a 90% vaccination rate with its vac vaccines that it developed of its people. Against that background, Madam Speaker, I make the call also for some important actions which I believe would address the, mo the most dire aspects of the humanitarian crisis in Cuba. One is suspending U.S. regulations that impede food, medicine, and other humanitarian assistance from reaching the Cuban people. 
simple, basic. The other, as others have um, alluded to, is removing Cuba from the state sponsor of terrorism list yes. because we know that that is not, not, true. True. not true. This this unwarranted designation places another roadblock in the path towards improved relations, and it creates further obstacles to purchasing or receiving humanitarian goods. Another is to remove or end the accusation that Cuba, as a government, is actually trafficking in persons, because again, we know that that is not so. And we have the proof here in Jamaica, we have seen it, of their doctors, their nurses, their teachers. And we know that these are not persons in modern day slavery. They are not persons who are being trafficked. Right. Yes, so that needs to be freed up. We also want to see the removing of all restrictions on family and non-family remittances. We in Jamaica understand just how important remittances have been to our economy and to our people. Free up the thing, love the people there. We also ask for the rolling back of the Trump administration measures that restrict travel to Cuba since they limit mutually beneficial dialogue between the US and Cuban people. And it also makes it more difficult for Cuban Americans to visit and reunite with family in Cuba particularly for those with families who are outside of Havana. Ojalá que dentro de poco tengamos este cambio de que hablamos año tras año. Ya es hora de respetar la voluntad y la dignidad del pueblo cubano. And that is to say, yes, <laughs> I hope that within a short period, we will have this change that we have been talking about year after year. It is time, as we would say, time come to respect, yes, the dignity and the will of the Cuban people. Ya es hora de poner fin a esta crueldad. Time come again, yes, time come to put an end to this cruelty. Viva la amistad entre Cuba y Jamaica. Long live the friendship between Cuba and Jamaica. As a Cuban leader, one of the greatest of all times once said, los principios son immutables. Their principles, we know, are immutable and are not negotiable. Patria o muerte. Venceremos. Many of you would know that as a famous saying from Cuba. Yes. Um, adopted from Che Guevara. Motherland or death. We shall overcome. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I join with my colleagues in strongly supporting the lifting of the embargo against the independent uh, state of Cuba, Republic of Cuba, and to more importantly allow its citizens to realize their full potential uh, in keeping with the expectations within the world order, human race, humanity, to not restrict opportunities and to allow for self-determination. Madam Speaker, I listened to my colleagues and I will not repeat what they have said and I'm sure others will want to speak, but I had to stand not just because of my own personal relations with the country, having visited several times and have met and spoken to a number of uh, persons, including at the Higher, higher level, the, the Minister of Health and others, but, also, but importantly because of the portfolio that I represent, health, and the relationship that is shared between uh, Jamaica and the Republic of Cuba as it relates to health care. Uh, a tradition that started well before my time, well before probably this administration, uh, 
and one that has done well for us as a people. And uh, indeed, I dare say, uh, that has done well for several countries globally. My understanding is that the Cuban healthcare workers are in about 70 countries around the world. Indeed, our latest experience with COVID, uh, I am told that the only country that was able in this period of uncertainty and fear to this, that was willing to dispatch its own citizens at great risk uh, to themselves, and indeed, even risk to that country itself where they needed all hands on deck to confront the COVID virus, um, where they dispatched more Cuban healthcare workers to countries around the world to confront this monster called COVID, which claims so many lives. For that reason, and that, well, Ebola too, but I'm, I'm referencing the most recent uh, health threat. For that reason, Madam Speaker, I believe that the Cuban people, the Cuban government, the Cuban state deserves an international award and recognition for that because they were willing to go out and to assist at a global level when the rest of us were more concerned with securing our own, which is understandable given the nature of the threat that, we've, but that we were placed under. But more routinely, the relationship in the health space has seen hundreds of Cubans, Cuban healthcare workers coming to Jamaica to complement our, our own workers here in the space. At this point, I think there are well over 300, probably closer to 400 Cuban healthcare workers in the public health system. And if they were not there, we would have a very difficult time dealing with the challenges that we currently face. What is ironic about this is that we train some of the best healthcare workers in the world, and the, 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 there is almost an expectation that we lose as we train to other parts of the world, the developed world, North America included, but Canada and the, and, and the UK in Europe. And uh, while it is a challenge for us, we understand and appreciate that mobility of labor is a feature of the global system. And when you juxtapose that against the mobility of Cuban healthcare workers, who are not just in Jamaica, but elsewhere in the world, and the criticisms that have been levied against them, uh, the, that state, for having their uh, citizens support the health and wellness of other jurisdictions, there is a glaring irony if not inconsistency in, 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 in that discussion. And it's something that I think we need to confront. Madam Speaker, I really want to place on record on behalf of the Jamaican people our appreciation to this country for what they have done. My own visit has demonstrated that in terms of innovation, sometimes out of necessity because of the embargo, more often than not out of necessity, there is so much we could learn from the leadership and from the Cuban people in terms of their way of life. In fact, having served in other portfolio areas in government, agriculture in particular, one of the lessons I learned early was the approach to disaster preparedness and management where they rarely lose a life, uh, whether it's livestock or, or humans, with the most severe hurricanes that they face. Um, um, more often than not, because as a country, they come together to face adversity and to do so as a collective in the interest of, of, of their people. We could learn a lot of lessons from them, and we have in many, in, in many respects. I close, Madam Speaker, by saying that the time to really rethink this embargo has come and indeed has come a long time ago. But the, 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 the COVID experience has taught us many things. One is that we really need to come to terms with our humanity. 
that we cannot survive on our own, that the need for respect and accommodation for self-determination while still finding ways around collaboration is a critical fundamental principle of the future. So I don't, I am, I am a lot less critical of any jurisdiction, any country, any nation state that is involved in a process of their own self-determination. Um, whether it is the free world led by North America, the United States of America that is, or it is the approach that is taken within the Cuban um, environment, Cuban population, the state. And what I'm more interested in and would like to promulgate, certainly in this house but beyond to the extent that we have influence, is mutual respect. And to see how we can expand that mutual respect to accommodate in a complementary way the advantages that we may individually share uh, for the benefit of all of us. Um, we are a very open society, Jamaica, and we have seen the benefits of that. We've also seen some of the downsides of that. So every system has its challenges, and we shouldn't pretend that there is any perfection uh, when it comes to uh, structures, system, or even human behavior. The issue is how do we build and make all of us better off by the positives that we have. And I am prepared to say that there is a lot that the people, the government, the state of Cuba has that we could learn from, and not just us, but others throughout the world. And so for that reason, Madam Speaker, I do urge those who do not share the views that this House clearly share, that it is in all our interests to rethink that position. As I say thanks to the Cuban people for their support in the health space. Thank you very much. Madam Speaker, I rise to lend my support to this resolution of the Honorable House in support of Cuba. I am pleased that Jamaica continues to stand in solidarity with the people of Cuba and that we continue to add our voices in calling for the lifting of the blockade. I confess that I remain puzzled that any country and any government that is committed to the norms of multilateralism and to international law could consider this act of unilateral aggression in the form of the blockade to be acceptable. And so, Madam Speaker, Jamaica's solidarity with the people of Cuba is the right thing to do. And I don't believe you can do wrong in doing right. Is lo correcto. Simply mean it is the right thing to do. Madam Speaker, I want to thank my colleagues for their contribution to this debate, calling yet again for an end to the blockade imposed by the United States of America against the people of Cuba. Um, Madam Speaker, permission having previously been given, and I'm mindful of the comments of the House Leader. Madam Speaker, what I would say is that if I were permitted to speak in a language other than that which is provided for in the standing order, I would say to His Excellency and the people of Cuba, que para siempre la gente de Jamaica está con todos ustedes. That the people of Jamaica continue to be with all of you. La verdad es que cada año estoy aquí para hablar estas palabras. Pero la verdad es que, sí, claro, en un aspecto me siento completamente orgulloso que yo soy la persona que puede hablar en este debate. Pero también, tras año tras año, me siento también un poco, un poco decepcionado. Decepcionado porque es la misma cosa cada año. En los United Nations siempre es la misma cosa también. No hay ningún cambio 
en este aspecto para la libertad, la dignidad y también así que la, 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 pues, la, la población de Cuba puede vivir sin miedo, puede vivir sin estos, este embargo ilegal en el mundo. Y ojalá, gracias a Dios, un día la gente de Cuba será libre, completamente libre de este embargo. Y, Melita, just to indicate also that I, I, I do believe that, Madam Speaker, that, that one day I truly hope that the people of Cuba will be free, free of this embargo. And, you know, so, Madam Speaker, in continuing, I, I wish to indicate that since 1972, Jamaica and Cuba, we have enjoyed a wonderful working relationship, notwithstanding the embargo. Cuba's always, Cuba remains our closest neighbor. Cuba has also established um, regional relations with CARICOM. Um, there will be the Cuba CARICOM Summit coming up in December, and we look forward to those discussions as well, and no doubt the question of the embargo will be featured. Madam Speaker, as we also celebrate UN Day today, and have in regard to the topic at hand as it relates to lifting the embargo against Cuba, I mentioned earlier that international humanitarian law and international law should transcend race, it should transcend borders, it should transcend geography, it should transcend even political policies. And Madam Speaker, in closing, on behalf of the people of Cuba and for the benefit of people everywhere across the world, I wish to leave these words from His Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie from Ethiopia, who spoke exactly 60 years ago on October 3rd, 1963, at the United Nations in New York. The words of Haile Selassie are important today more than ever. Until the philosophy which holds one race superior and another inferior is finally and permanently discredited and abandoned, everywhere is war. And until there are no longer first-class citizens and second-class citizens of any nation, until the color of a man's skin is no more significant than the color of his eyes, and until the basic human rights are equally guaranteed to all without regard to race, there is war. And until that day, the dream of lasting peace, world citizenship, rule of international morality will remain but a fleeting illusion to be pursued but never attained. Now everywhere is war. I thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Member Terralong. House Leader. It is not intended to do any further business for the day. But I, on this motion of adjournment, would like to implore this honorable host to recognize that it is ruled by the standing orders. And that in every instance, every abrogation of the standing orders is an undermining of the integrity of that order. And members must recognize this because we are on show. And it was a little difficult to watch the interpreters and those who were trying to convey to individuals who are not as able to respond to the verbal statements as we do. She had great difficulty doing so. And we made the point that the hands are that records the proceedings of the House is, in, is unable to record what you have said. So half of what you might have said is just to yourself or to those who can understand your language somewhere else, which is not in keeping with the tradition of this honorable house. So I, I recognize that there are times when we use phrases that convey very strongly the points we are made in a language other than our own. That is acceptable. But to make an extended commentary in a foreign language is not in keeping with the tradition of this house. Madam Speaker, may it please you as I move for the adjournment of this honorable house until tomorrow, uh, October 25 at 2 p.m. in the George William Gordon House. And at the time, Madam Speaker, there will be three speakers for the state of the constituency debate. The member from Manchester Central will be included with the other two members that we indicated earlier on. May it please you, Madam Speaker.
The question is that this Honorable House do now adjourn until tomorrow, Wednesday, October 25th at 2 p.m. sharp. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. This Honorable House now stands adjourned. This is the Aedes aegypti mosquito that spreads 